on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party Peace and love, party people. It's the BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli, and the place to be. You are now checking out the world's best podcast, The People's Party. And as always, and as usual, I have my lovely and talented and thought-provoking and thoughtful, funny co-host, best co-host in the podcast game, Jasmine Lee, and a place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you feeling? <laughs> oh, my God, Talib. I literally cannot contain my excitement right now. I really Was that do- your excitement laugh? <laughs> that was my excitement laugh. It really was. It was, it was. it was. Why are you so excited? Oh, my God, because my childhood is sitting right in front of me. <laughs> ah, it's going to be a great episode. No doubt. Well, today's episode, we have an icon. Mention this man's name to any comedian, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's the OG. We're talking about a man who has worked on nearly 20 films, from small roles to huge roles, to roles where he plays himself, to working behind a camera. You've seen him in films like Critical Condition, with Richard Pryor, Dirty Work, Half-Baked. This guest is a staple of American culture through television. He was on Bosom Buddies. He was on The Greatest American Hero. You fell in love with him on Full House. You fell in love with him again as the voice of Ted Mosby. I was a fan of him in a little show that didn't do that well, but I liked to get a lot called Life and Times of Tim. I'm talking about the host of America's Funniest Home Videos, the iconic father of not just Full House, but Fuller House, a comics comic. Give it up for the man, the myth, the legend, the illest motherfucker in a cardigan sweater. (laughs) Bob Saget is in the house. How do I follow this? I would stand up if I wouldn't fall. In my I, I don't, I'm honored beyond. I, I'm humbled. I don't know what to do. Well, thank you for gracing our presence. Thank oh. you. Thank you for gracing me by inviting me. Yeah. Oh, um, gee. I, I always think it's old, old goat at a certain Old point. goat. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really original gangster. Yeah, yeah. But that has come to mean much more than gangster. Just, you know, old goat. <laughs> That's what I do, yeah, is yeah, just yeah, to yeah. be humble, because yeah. I do possess that quality. So, Bob, how you feeling? I'm good. good I'm to good. See you. I, you too. And and uh, you've been well through this insanity that we live. I have. I've been as well as can be expected. Yeah. It's yes. uh, and Jasmine, you've been well. I have been well, and I don't know if you know this or not, but I actually met both of you two at Jeff's house at different occasions, and okay. now here we all are. Jeff Ross is part of the origin the story of this show. I met Jasmine through Jeff Ross. That's hilarious. Yes. That is hilarious. That is. <laughs> he his parties are Crazy. very memorable. Yes. <laughs> yes, you had some of my macaroni and cheese. That now I remember everything. Okay. <laughs> I, remember, I remember meeting you and I was wondering where and that makes all sense. Because yeah. he is uh he's a sweetheart. Yeah, shout he out really to Jeff is. Ross. Um, he, I know he's high wherever he is. Yes. Probably. Yes. Um speaking of Jeff Ross, I want to start by discussing the respect that you get from other comedians. Because it goes beyond just the shock of seeing America's dad do dirty jokes or work blue. You know, that's that's a story that's been told since the beginning of your career. Right. But I think for people like me, I grew up, you know, I was a kid in the 80s and, and trying not to be a kid in the 90s. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's certain comedians and certain people you see working, whether you see them in television shows which network t- network TV or you see them on commercials or you just see them working like, you know, to tonight's show, old footage of people, you know, doing things that people would consider shtick. Right. Um, and that's your only relationship with those people. But if you're lucky like me, you become friends with comedians. And then you realize that there's a whole other world out there and a whole other tribe that these people belong to mm-hmm. that is like the iceberg. You just see the tip but what really sinks the boat is everything under it. And so it's like your work on television, where most people know you from, Mm -hmm. is really just the tip of the iceberg, Mm -hmm. and comedians know this. Normally, I would go to just the tip, and then I would... (laughs) There'd be five minutes, but I'm I've grown up. Past I was that. trying to be serious. And no, I, I've been I, I've become more mature because you're, you're correct. That. The metaphor is uh, yes. <laughs> exactly accurate. How does that make you feel? I um, didn't know I was going to be a comedian, mm-hmm. and sometimes you feel like the jury's still out on you because mm-hmm. uh, I'm my own worst critic. And mm-hmm. if anyone ever says, "Oh, you did this and you did this, or you disappointed me, or this didn't stand up well through time. Here we are in 2021. What did you say that for? You know, I, I, so I know it way ahead of anybody else. Right. Because I'm not this guy that's not self-aware. Right. I, I criticize myself and want to better myself and always will. 
but I'm uh, I'm very touched and I get emotional when people regard me in that way. I just I love. We all get frustrated with people. We all mm -hmm. get upset with people. Mm -hmm. The world is upsetting a lot. Mm -hmm. But I love people, and I was raised that way. And when I was persecuted as a kid, living in Virginia, for being a Jewish kid, I still got through it with humor mm -hmm. and tried to make friends. And then when a group, I mean, people that make you laugh, when you get into that group and you find out, wait a minute, that's who I'm like, mm -hmm. you can't believe it. Right. And, and then you go, they're my family. I mean, mm -hmm. there's something, and I've been talking about it with a lot of comedians mm -hmm. and I do it on my podcast, but I do it in life. And when we've hung out together mm -hmm. and, and were able to be in Yellow Springs with Dave Chappelle mm -hmm. both times, the first mm -hmm. time that had to shut down. Mm -hmm. And then that second time when I went back right. for those four days that were a celebration of we got to yes. go back. There's something about that camaraderie that, you can't even explain. We all come from somewhere to really analyze the world. We're outsiders, and yet we're insiders because we want to make people feel better. Mm -hmm. We want to talk truth, or we want to forget things and and talk, uh, making people laugh, mm -hmm. making yourself laugh, and then getting real, which I'm doing more and more as I get older. Mm -hmm. But to have that relationship with comedians and for them to regard me that way, it actually shocks me, mm. to be honest. I, I don't, I always feel I'm not worthy, but I guess that's what um, helps me grow. Right. Mm. And, and keeps me uh, hopefully as good a person as I can be. That's beautiful. I think you're an amazing person, and I think that when you idolize people growing up, because you were one of my TV dads, you know, when you meet the person and they're just as nice and just as cool <laughs> and even more hilarious than they were on TV, it's like, you know, as a comedian and an actress and just a fan, it's like, you know, it's great to be in your presence. That's so sweet. And I didn't go to jail for anything. Like <laughs> well, the other TV dad, right? I don't want to mention. Well, I mean, you did, go to, that you did go to Temple jail. University, and you are from Philly, correct? So, and, some... and he didn't graduate, and he got a doctorate, and mm -hmm. I graduated. Where's my doctorate? <laughs> <laughs> you were just talking about your Jewish upbringing. Right. Um, you did come from a Jewish family. Your father was a supermarket um, executive in charge of meat. And your mom was a hospital administrator. Um, they're both very hardworking folks. And did that affect your upbringing and your own work ethic? The fact that you know all this about me. <laughs> I seem like a stalker now, don't no, I? No. <laughs> I'm good with it. Cause it's I, a people's I, party. We do our research. You know, and not only that, but when you, what you want your whole life, if you're a performer, if you're a broadcaster, mm -hmm. if you're an, a music artist, mm -hmm. is for people to know who you are, yeah. and then they go, oh, well, that's, oh, I, I get you. You wait your whole life for people to get you. Yeah. And the earlier you can find that out and know who you are. So to answer your question, <laughs> <laughs> and then I bought a car once. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, my parents were strong work ethic, came from a hard life. My dad was a depression kid mm -hmm. uh, and raised his siblings because his father got liver cancer because he couldn't live he drank mm -hmm. and uh and so my mom also came from a hard-working family and so i was raised to i lived at home during college and went to film school at temple university and i lived with my parents which is scary but uh ray romano did it <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to live at your folks you know right but i i made films and mm. i worked in a supermarket while i went to college mm. and so i knew what work was and I always I've always worked you know mm -hmm. I, and I work from I work when I'm trying to sleep sometimes which is right. difficult does yeah. your mind go all the time definitely goes all the time yeah and I, I definitely have like um lucid dreams and stuff like that I come from hardworking people too my my parents are teachers I know right I did some research okay he does some research <laughs> well I also when I met you uh -huh. I, I I went right to the Google because okay. I wanted to know you come from professors I, I mean, do and yeah. my younger brother is a teacher um I had to stop calling him uh my little brother once yes. he got past 40 hmm. and we had him on this show he wrote a book called where rights went wrong he's a constitutional law professor and he knows everything about the constitution 
We need him. We need him, yeah. We got to protect him at all costs, Mm -hmm. wrap him in bubble wrap and all that. Yes. Um, Speaking of teachers, you had a teacher in your life, Elaine Zimmerman, who convinced you to start working in film. Is that correct? Yeah. I had to make up. I moved so much. I moved the middle of ninth grade from Virginia to Encino, California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? And I learned materialism. That's what I learned there. (laughs) And then between 11th and 12th, I moved from uh, Encino back to Philadelphia where I was born Mm -hmm. and graduated from Abington High. So one year there, I had to make up two years of English and Elaine Zimmerman, even though I wasn't an honor student or a straight A student, Mm -hmm. met with me. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Um, I'll take you on and tried to give me books that stimulated me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like, I couldn't read Moby Dick. I said, I can't read about a knot in a rope for three right. pages. And right. then she gave me uh, <laughs> she gave me Grapes of Wrath mm-hmm. and she gave me Mice and Men mm-hmm. and I read the whole book, both mm-hmm. of them. And then she went, oh, he needs real stuff. Real, he doesn't yeah. want to read about uh, poetic, amazing writing right. by Herman Melville, but I didn't want to see a whale killed right. um, or read or see it in my mind. Right. And then I was making student films and I was writing songs, serious songs, really bad ones. Um, <laughs> And I was going to go to pre-med mm-hmm. at uh, Temple. And she said, don't don't become a doctor. Become a, a comedian. The joke was that she saved thousands of lives. Because <laughs> that's the truth. I that's would've. funny. There's a show right now streaming called Dr. Death where this guy, and it's, it's a really strong show, but it's a guy that, it's a true story. He was killing people. Um, I saw an ad for that. Is that about Kevorkian? No. It's, it's about, about somebody else. A, about another guy. Mm-hmm. And it's got uh, Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin try to crack the case. Really good actors in it. Yeah, um, that's a good cast right there. It's really good. And the lead is, I, I forgot his name, and he's so damn good. He's the star. Um, okay. He's this crazy doctor. But I was afraid that I was going to do stuff like that. <laughs> right, right. Let me just put this power drill in your spine. <laughs> oh, no. I wanted to be a pediatric surgeon. That's So I wanted to help kids because right. I had role models. But... I, I was pre-med for six months, and then I, I went into film school, and I, I loved it. And I made a, a documentary uh, about my nephew who had his face reconstructed. Right, through Adam's eyes. Yeah. yeah. You know everything. <laughs> You're inside my head. And and it won the Student Oscar uh, Merit Award for documentaries, mm-hmm. so the Academy flew me out. And I missed my graduation from Temple University. Mm. And when they flew me out, I went up at the comedy store, because I'd been doing stand-up, mm-hmm. I'd been doing improv. I always did a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And the owner, Mitzi, said, you should work here. And that, that <laughs> would have been for nothing. To, and right. I did. I, I moved out to L.A. and I started there. It's a, it's an interesting journey. You don't know what door doors I pushed on wouldn't open and doors would just open. Mm. And I found out that I'm a comedian. Wow. Mitzi Shore, right? She's mm-hmm. involved in so many, so many comedian stories. I think her name has come up in just about every comedian that we've had Rest yeah. on the show. Mitzi. There was one time she told me I'd lost it. I wasn't funny anymore. Mm. And uh, it broke me. It really hurt me. And she, and I was in Vegas, and that's where it happened. But she didn't know that I was up all night. The reason she saw a bad set was I was trying to keep one of the comedians sober because mm. he'd stayed up all night with all kinds of substances and yeah. alcohol. And I went into his room and... and uh, he had booze everywhere and hamburgers everywhere, and mm. I tried to get him. In, and he made it to the show, but I was exhausted because I was trying to mm. save him, and I was all nervous, hadn't slept. And that that was the reason I had a, a bad set right? because it's hard to have a good one if you haven't slept. Right, I can but, that, but she was right, and I, I had lost it mm. because I shouldn't have done that in the first place. Right. And I should have taken care of myself, and I was losing it. Mm. And so I, I regrouped. Which I do every my whole life. I've tracked myself in a way. My flow chart is every five six years. I try to reset. Mm. I tried to be a door guy too, and they said they didn't hire women, but you know now they do. So, <laughs> but um, at twenty two, you had a gangrenous appendix taken out, um, and the ordeal almost killed you. After that experience. Um, how were you after that? Did you become more confident, more fearless? Um, how did that scare shape you? This is so, this is the best interview I've ever had. <laughs> I'm glad. Dude, this is like, no doubt. I feel so good right now. Do you remember the TV show, This Is Your Life? Yeah, of course. Well, I'm not, 
that shit was off the air. You're not old enough right. for that. Right. It was off the air by the time I was, was born. I was too, I'm too young for it, believe it or not, also. It's it old. Was, it's Ralph Edwards would, right. would tell people, and they'd have people on, famous people. Yeah. And they'd bring everybody out there, school teacher. Yep. You guys know everything. That's, that was like sort of my inspiration for this. Right. Yeah. Well, you've and, done and it. And like it is with Gil Noble, which was on ABC for like 30 years. It's like a show about black issues. Right. It's on Sunday mornings early before everybody went to church. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's just like a mix of Gil Noble and this is your life. Oh, you can't bring Elaine Zimmerman back. She, <laughs> that teacher's gone, right. sadly. Here she is. Oh, she don't look good. <laughs> right. what, what, are they, what is it called? When they bring they they bring dead people, but they're not really a hologram. Hologram. <laughs> oh, we can hologram, yeah, hologram her. What the heck? I so literally lost Luke my Skywalker. Yeah, That'd we need to bring beautiful. a hologram of yeah, Elaine hologram Zimmerman. Elaine Zimmerman. She was uh, every teacher. Well, teachers are both of my sisters who are not alive anymore were teachers, mm. and they did beautiful things. I hear from people now that say that uh, your sister. My sister, her name was Gay, and of course people are dumb and make mm -hmm. fun of it online, mm -hmm. you know, because people are wrong. Right. And they said, she changed my life. Your sister mm -hmm. changed my life. But the appendix was a life-changing thing because I wasn't a known person. And if you go to an L.A. hospital and you're not known, you don't care. Uh, you're not going to live. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the real shit about hospitals. It. And it was, hospitals kill people yep. they, out here. They do. Yeah. And I was 21, and I I was in severe pain. And I didn't know it was my appendix, but it was my right side. And I went to, uh, and to UCLA, and uh, not to badmouth the hospital, because they've been good to me since with family members and stuff. But they just put ice packs on it, and the doctor didn't uh, didn't come. So seven hours I laid there, and that's why it, it the appendix split open. And I had gangrene, and they had to keep me away from everybody. And they never stitched it up, so I had to stuff an open hole, like mm. a wound, like a war wound, mm. with gauze. It's a beautiful mm. story. <laughs> I hope people are eating while they're listening. <laughs> but it took months for it to – it still looks uh, not great. Mm. I work on my abs so much. <laughs> UCLA just got voted one of the top hospitals in the um, – it was number three, I think. Three or four. It is, it is now. Yeah. And I think it was then. I mean, there was a show on CBS called Medical Center mm -hmm. with Chad Everett. And that I used to watch that as a kid. And I went, oh, that'll be great right. if anything ever happens to me. I'll go there. And I, and I did. And I almost died. Damn. <laughs> but since then, they've done some nice things for me. And they they have a great brain center and stuff like that. Mm. But, you know, that was not a good experience. And it did change my life in a way. But at 21, when you have something happen to you, it's not the same as when someone happens to you at 45 mm. or 50 or, well, it doesn't matter what age, mm -hmm. when traumatic things happen to mm -hmm. people. It, it, it's life-changing. So yeah. it, it made me, I think, I just barreled ahead with work. I just did stand-up all the time mm. and studied acting and all kinds of stuff. It made me focus, I think, more. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember that much because being 21. And, Who remembers I was that? on Demerol. Wow. Yeah, you don't know <laughs> yeah. nothing. Shit, 21. Right? I don't remember 21, and I'm closer to it than everyone in this. I'm just kidding, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're definitely closer than I <laughs> In 96, you directed The Hope for ABC, which was based on your sister, Gay Saget, who you just mentioned, um, who passed away in, excuse my pronunciation, scleroderma. Derma? You're there. It's scleroderma. Scleroderma. I finally got something right. Um, Research Foundation. Um, was that a difficult project to work on and or did you see it as a sort of a tribute it's it was both i didn't know what i was undertaking my, my sister passed away from scleroderma which is latin for hardening of the skin and um it's a rare disease but it's not as rare as people think mm -hmm. and it affects mostly women in the prime of their lives mm -hmm. and they couldn't diagnose it which there's medicine and it's mm -hmm. not not at its best and then she deteriorated really quickly, and we tried to get her the right help. And again, she was misdiagnosed and mistreated, mm. and they did terrible stuff. So I was upset about it and wanted to get the word out, and I had a, a good position at ABC. Mm. And because of Bob Iger and Ted Harbert um, and my manager, Brad Gray and Bernie Brillstein, they produced it and I was able to make this movie. It was actually Lori Lachlan that said to me, you should make a TV movie about your sister mm -hmm. and direct it because ABC was saying, you know, want to direct something? Okay. And 
So two years later, after she died, which is really soon after, I had a great screenwriter, Susan Rice, and uh, Karen Moore, great producer, produced it. She produced Breaking Bad for a while. Right. And we made this movie, and Dana Delaney starred in it, and I directed it. And then I went to promote it, and I went with Sharon Monsky, who founded the Scleroderma Research Foundation, which we've raised over $50 million for wow. research and, and are really helping people now. The founder of that organization, Sharon Monsky, went on Oprah with me. Mm. This was a defining moment. 1996, we're promoting this TV movie coming out a week later, mm. as you do. And I'm there with Sharon, who's very frail mm. and uh, one of the most beautiful women I'll ever know, people. And um, we, and Oprah said to me during a commercial break, uh, this is really going to change your life. You're, wow. you're in for some some trouble. This is going to mess up your head. That's not exactly the wording she used, but I don't want to drop an F-bomb as right. a quote from Oprah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but she was really... We protect Oprah. Well, we do. Oprah's human too. And she was beautiful and uh, was right. And it, it my whole life changed after it. Um, it. It's really strange when you do something autobiographical, which is true of all artists. Mm -hmm. It's life changing because you're putting yourself out there, mm -hmm. and here I was exposing my family and what my sister went through, and and you know it's it was a comedy disease of the week movie. Wow! wow. So and and it did really well both critically and in the ratings. It won for the night and all that, but that the important thing was that it got the word out yeah. about this killer, this disease, and uh, you never get over the loss of a sibling or. A, anybody that you love mm -hmm. so that was a, a a dedication to her and something to help others that are going through it it's beautiful we're gonna go to the beginning of your career <laughs> and talk about your set on at Dangerfields, right which you can still watch on youtube to this day mm -hmm. was that your first time on tv or no i'd done some things there was a show called make me laugh okay where we would have one minute to make people laugh okay and so that show that was uh, howie mandel was on it gary shambling mm. a lot of us would do it we were not known it was 1979 right and and i'd done a couple other tv shows but uh this was a big deal because i yeah. become close with rodney rodney that's you that became like your really good friend right rodney yeah Dangerfield. i was working at the comedy store in la jolla and he walked in with two ladies <laughs> and went hey man i saw you on the merv griffin show you're funny <laughs> you're, you're jewish you got a fucked up head you're never gonna be happy <laughs> and i went oh a new friend right <laughs> he knows me and we became friends and That's i hung dope. out with him and um I never really smoked dope, but Rodney loved mm -hmm. it and, and swore by it. Mm -hmm. um, he said, I'm going to smoke it every day, man. I don't <laughs> care who knows. It's the best. Right. And I have many Rodney stories, but he put me on the Young Comedian special. And I had met Sam Kennison, who mm -hmm. was on that special, yeah. in Houston. And he had been a faith healer. They would set up the tents, mm -hmm. and he and his brother Bill, and they would do it kind of a charlatan thing, you know, yeah. that, like Leap of Faith, like right. the Steve mm -hmm. Martin movie in play. And then I introduced him to Rodney. And then I also told Mitzi, this Sam Kennison's coming up Monday night. And I sat with her while Sam did his showcase at the comedy wow. store. And Sam, you know, the rafters shook. Wow. Because people hadn't, you know, him saying, you know, the cameraman can give the starving kid a sandwich. Mm -hmm. That was the poignancy that came through. Mm -hmm. That was the moment that he went, okay, he's screaming because of the conditions of the world and because of his relationship mm -hmm with his interpretation of God and Jesus. Wow. And there's a lot of depth and a lot of darkness in Sam. And and I was close with him for a while, but then I couldn't be close because I couldn't go to the dark side that he went yeah. to. Yeah. He went but hard I loved and fast. Him very much so. Yeah. And and yet his when he died, it wasn't he wasn't a drug taker, mm. you know. It was a car accident. Yeah. And that's a, someone's going to make a movie out of it. I, I know that. Yeah, the Sam Kinison movie. That's going to be crazy. Yeah. yeah. But that was, that Rodney Dangerfield Young Comedian special was was Sam. It was Louis Anderson. Ooh. It was Rita Rudner. It was Yakov Shmirnov. It was Bob Nelson. It was interesting. And it was, it was a life-changing moment, too. 
Right. Even though I'd done 15 minutes and they cut me down to like three or four, uh-huh. Sam did 15 minutes and he got 15 he minutes. He got 15, right. <laughs> and Rodney, he said, what could I do? Sam killed. <laughs> <laughs> Or at uh, rest in peace, Rodney Dangerfield as well. Rest That's in peace. A, Rodney Dangerfield is another person who was an influence in my life, not unlike many people, um, Richard and um, Don Rickles, mm-hmm. and but he, Rodney loved young comedians, loved comedians. Yeah, he was my first uh, memory of understanding how beautiful stand-up could be was watching that Dangerfield show, right. that first HBO thing, right? Yeah. Like, it, my parents were early in the neighborhood with HBO. We had mm-hmm. WHT, then we had HBO. And I remember it was like, and HBO did a bunch of comedy things after that, but I was Rodney's show, that was re- pretty early, right? It was, the, it was the first one that Rodney hosted, but I believe it was the ninth annual one that they did. Okay. So they started it, I think, with Robert Klein and okay. some other people. But this that's was the, the one first... I remember. Then that's yeah, when I was a kid. Yeah, when Rodney was the, cracking. I think that's the defining one yeah. for a lot of people. That yeah. one, and then he did the next one, and I, I think Seinfeld was on either the one. I think he was on the one after, mm-hmm. but he was a year older than me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and HBO was George Carlin's. Yeah, net, he did fourteen specials on. Yeah, that. those are monu- those are monuments. You listen to him now, mm-hmm. and you go, "Oh my God, right. we have not changed." Mm. Mo Hammer got a great George Carlin. Uh, like the way he does his, his voice, his personation, it's really old really boy. yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, ask him about it. One I day. will. Ask him to I Carlin will. for you. You went from hosting um, CBS The Morning Program <laughs> to <laughs> playing this is Dan- my life <laughs> <laughs> to playing Danny Tanner on Full House. Then you started on the second season. You started. Being a part of the San Fran- on the Wake Up San Francisco show, right? But I didn't start as that. What happened was, um, I, they had me as a sportscaster originally, mm-hmm. and then it wasn't even the Tanner family. The original script was the Winchester family. Really, that did not work. That no, <laughs> that's like a rifle. But yeah, I was on this CBS morning program, I, I, and um, they fired me after five months. I was on with Marriott Hartley and Rollin Smith, and she asked me, are you a type A personality? And I said, yes, but I'm working on my anus. <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a dash. And you can't say anus, apparently. And so they sent me to my room, and I really, I had to go up the stairs behind a flat, behind a door, and I never came back. Wow, It was kind of weird. But then they wanted me originally for the pilot of Full House. And okay. so um, I was back in LA with that other show and we did a screen test with John Stamos and Dave Coulier mm-hmm. and I replaced the guy which made me feel bad mm. um still feel bad but then uh yeah I was a new I was a sports announcer and it just they went oh, this bob and sports things not working mm-hmm. <laughs> so then and then uh Lori joined the show a year later and that's when Wake Up San Francisco became she was my co-host yeah that's right I had it first and, and then she, she joined, on. and I was jealous that yeah. she was taking some of my <laughs> classic Your, sitcom. Yes, class. exactly. And so, <laughs> it's the, the Kelly and Regis uh, right. to Ryan uh, syndrome. Right. <laughs> so did you tell them that they should change it to the morning show because you had ho- hosted a morning show in real life, or that just happened? It just happened. Oh. Mm. But I think it, it, it art imitates life because mm-hmm. it's, it's often the best stuff. It's, it's organic, and you don't know why. Well, you lasted on Wake Up San Francisco more than five months, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was the whole length of the thing. And we even ended up doing it in Fuller House. Yes. Yeah. It came back, which was a lot of fun. Tell us about Jeff Franklin, because I don't really know about this man other than I see his name, like, on TV all the time. Right. Um, he's the, like, creator of Full House, right? And- he is. I met Jeff when um, he had been working uh, as a staff writer on Laverne and Shirley. So wow, it's classic. So he went back with uh, Mark Sotkin and, and Chris Thompson and other people. And um, Chris Thompson was a friend of mine and the exec producer of Bosom Buddies. Okay. And Jeff Franklin was a writer on Bosom Buddies. I, by the way, love Bosom Buddies. Was, I used to watch I, it all the time. And I remember seeing you on it. I didn't realize it was you at the time because I didn't know who you were. I didn't know who I was. But when I was here, right, <laughs> you were Bob the Comic, apparently. Well, I didn't have a name. Tom <laughs> Hanks named me because he went, why doesn't he have a name? Right. So we went, Bob the comic. Bob, right, the, Bob the comic, right. And I was the audience warm up. Mm. I would uh, warm the audience up. Mm. I would do four hours, five hours, however long mm. it took to shoot the show. 
and uh, Jeff Franklin was a writer on it. And uh, same producers, Tom Miller and Bob Boyette, exec mm -hmm. producers of that show, mm -hmm. who also did Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, mm -hmm. a lot of established major right. shows. And then later on, Full House, Step by Step, The Hogan's, mm -hmm. I mean, major and Perfect Strangers, mm -hmm. those were their shows. And All on, the catchphrase shows. Mm -hmm. Totally. Right. Don't be ridiculous. All of them all had the, hooks. Right, all the hooks. How yeah. rude. <laughs> On nuts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then with uh, Full House, it was Tom Miller and Bob Boyette, and Je it was Jeff Franklin's baby. Mm. So he started uh, the show, and Tom Miller liked me because I had been in the Richard Pryor film Critical Condition, which he saw. That's an underrated film, I think. Well, for me, it was a dream. Cause, and then, ironically... My friend Chris Thompson, the exec producer of Bosom Buddies, uh, wrote new scenes for Critical Condition for me to be in it. Wow. Uh, the additional scenes because they needed some more comedy and they, they heard that our scenes were working. So they wrote one for Garrett Morris and myself and, and Richard and then another one for me to be part of another bit with Richard. So my part got embellished because Richard and I had a thing. And you became close with Richard at that time. I, I did. And, and closeness with Richard, with in this case, this was after the fire. So he was, uh, he was a little frail at mm. times. Man, I just watched Sunset Strip. It was on TV two nights ago. It's insane. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, this, like him revisiting that trauma and going back. And the fact that a lot of what he was doing at at the time was just character work, you know, just like watching him go into that trauma and then thank you, thank you very much, and come back out of it was jarring. There will always be only one. Mm -hmm. I mean that a Richard Pryor comes around every couple hundred years. Although we have we have several <laughs> we have Dave. Right. You know, we have people that have redefined mm -hmm. and in a healthier way. Yeah. But Richard we would go to dinner, and it was a, a doing Critical Condition in High Point, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Apt had directed it. It was uh, Joe Montaigne and Rubound Blades. Blades, I, I never knew. Um, and he never corrected me. <laughs> and Rachel Ticketon and all these cool, interesting people. Mm -hmm. And we would go to dinner, and then one night I, I didn't invite Richard because I felt that he had had a rough day. Mm -hmm. And then the next day he wouldn't talk to me. Wow. And then I thought about it, and then I went, oh, God. I screwed up. I was tr so I knocked on his door, and I said, "Hey, I'm really sorry. I didn't invite you because I d I thought you're having a rough day, and I wanted to leave you alone." And he was like, well, "Okay, just don't don't do that again." Oh. And then we went to dinner after that, and that made us. That's how you make a friend, that's how you make a friend especially yeah. if they have the complexity of Richard Pryor's brain. Yeah, and then. I would always see him, you know, uh, and I was hosting the comedy store for eight years, and so I'd see him all the time there, and we would talk and, and hang, and there was a true affection. Um, I, you know, it, I wasn't as tight with him as he was with so many other people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Paul Mooney. And, and Obviously, all, yeah. Rest in peace, Paul Mooney. His inner sanctum of his mm -hmm. life. But he was, my God, I mean... <laughs> I, the fact that he found me funny, I just couldn't even. And, and we I asked him one time, when did you find out you were funny? Mm. And we both said at the same time, four. We were four <laughs> years old. Because here he was growing up in a, a house of ill repute. House of ill repute is the word for it. And here he was watching horrible things. Mm. Yeah. A lot of junkies. A lot of toxic shit. All toxic. Mm. Death and, mm. you know. When he did Lady Sings the Blues, I, I was a kid. I didn't know mm -hmm. him. Um, and I'm going, God damn, he can do anything. You know, yeah. this is, and he's living the experience that he yeah. watched. Yeah. And I got to spend time with him uh, at near the end of his life. I mm -hmm. visited his house and I would, we'd watch his widescreen TV, which was rear projection. <laughs> And we would just talk about people, and he would tell me who he liked and didn't like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was how you do when you're hanging out. That's with precious. Them. Yes. It's, it was. That's uh, precious. You know, I'm very emotional. Yeah. That's the goat. That's yeah. the goat, yeah. Yeah. In 1989, you begin hosting America's Funniest <laughs> Home Videos. I'm <laughs> trying to forget. <laughs> Every time I ask a question, you start laughing. Um, in 1989, you started hosting America's Funniest Home Videos, which lasted 
almost a decade. So between that and Full House, you pretty much took over everybody's <laughs> households. How? What was that like for you? How did, like, just knowing that you were, like, the main force in everyone's family TV watching? Well, I knew that it was a gift, and I knew that um, I was incredibly appreciative. I never sought out to be, you know, rich and famous, although as when you're younger, you think of those things. Mm -hmm. But there was an article that came out. Somebody came up to me once. I was about to win some award in Philadelphia. And um, they said, aren't you frustrated that you don't get to be as funny as your stand-up persona on the video show and in Full House? And they, she put a mic in my huh? face and she just hazed me. And I went, yeah, it is frustrating. 75 newspapers. It wasn't, there was no internet. Right. It's, and 70, Saget is frustrated with Full House. <laughs> and my producer, Jeff Franklin, took me to lunch and holds up the newspaper. Oh, no. <laughs> like, what did you do? But the truth is, mm -hmm. you know, I love doing stuff for everyone. And you mm -hmm. have to, if you're going to have families at seven o'clock on a Sunday night, watch people get hit in the nuts. <laughs> right. I mean, I watch this every Sunday night. Me and my yes, family watch this it together. every Sunday night And together. there was no internet. Mm -hmm. There, you know, We were all was, doing this together. Mm -hmm. There was, was nothing. And so it would get a 30 share or a 40 share, which means that's a lot that's of a people. 30% of people watching TV are watching this show on a Sunday night. And, you know, it's still on. It's over 30 still years. On, yeah. And Alfonso does a great job because, you know, it's what it is. They I don't met do him when he was doing the tap dance kid on Broadway. Really? Because my cousin Jimmy Tate was also a tap dancer, was like his understudy at the time. So I got to meet Alfonso when he was doing like the Coca-Cola or Pepsi ads with Michael Jackson. Right. Yeah. He can dance. Oh, he can Holy. dance for real. Well, the Carlton. I yeah. Mean, you know, he I, made up a dance. <laughs> yeah, he really did. And I got to say, he didn't even make that dance up. He just made it into the Carlton. That was like how black people imitated white people dancing back then. Yes. <laughs> and then he, he's just the one to put it on television. <laughs> my, my white people dancing is much worse than that. There's no hip movement. No I, hips? I no. No, it's just that thing where you stand. You got right. one of my favorite episodes of Seinfeld. Do you guys remember when Elaine was couldn't dance? Yeah. And she's like, oh, like this. Yeah. And every time I see a white person dancing in a club, I think of that episode with Elaine <laughs> and those thumbs. Man, I could, I if music is is right, and I I usually have to have like a beer in my hand, so I'm I'm <laughs> cheating. That's right. not dancing. That's just feeling free. But, right, but I I feel music very hard. Music's very a huge part of my life. Yes, Your on. music's insane. Oh, thank you. That's, that no, I'm not kidding. I mean, get by is like, I mean, I it's in my head. Good. It, when I when you <laughs> I was asked to do this, uh -huh. I just heard it on a. It loop. just came came under your head. Stop. <laughs> That's beautiful. Just to get by. Um, to, you don't mind if I, you get royalties if I sing it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do I get royalties if he sings it? I think it depends on how you well you sing it. You gotta pay Talib to play them singing it, huh? The worst thing you could do is sing someone's song to them. <laughs> Everybody says, "Don't do it." Do people sing the full house song? I was just about All to do it. So I don't <laughs> everywhere you look, they sing right. it to me. That everywhere song is just you look, yeah. Everywhere, everywhere you look, Jesse Frederick, right? Yeah, and and Jeff Franklin. And Jeff Franklin. He, he, he knew how to make money. He was like, okay, this is what it's going to be, and it's like fucking so much saxophone and like '80s rock guy voice. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like and like everywhere you look. <laughs> right. <laughs> now this is the same team that made the Family Matters song. I wouldn't be surprised. It's it sounds exactly is. like Oh, it is? Is it's it Jesse Frederick? De Jesse Frederick. Well, it's not Jeff Franklin, but it's right. Jesse Frederick and whoever he rocks with. <laughs> you know, that's that's like, and the song, the songs are like interchangeable. They're the same, they're almost the same song. Well, that's what happens. That always happens when yeah. the show spins off right away. That was an interesting show, Family Matters. Did we confirm Jaleel White? Yes. Oh, well, he's coming tomorrow. He's a sweetheart. He's and a great guy. I was just talking about him last night. I, w I was out to dinner with Candace Cameron Bure, who was mm -hmm. DJ, mm -hmm. and her husband <laughs> Val Bure, mm -hmm. a great famed hockey player. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about Jaleel and how smart he is mm -hmm. and how they've stayed in touch. And, and I got to see him in Yellow Springs. That's right. Um, was he... <laughs> no, because it was the other the other no, girl, right? No, Journey. Journey. I was about to say, was he and, the only black Taj person Mori on Full House? And was on there, too. Uh, no. Journey, uh, Journey Smollett. Smollett. Yeah. Right, right, right. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, Journey, because yeah. um, they oh, had that, did, that, I, that Journey. fight. Is it Journey oh, or Journey? I thought it was Journey, but I'm always wrong. I've yeah, heard it pronounced right. both ways. My last name is Saget. <laughs> Are you lying? No, I am. I am lying. Okay, <laughs> yes. I was gonna because I was gonna say but, that and probably get in some arguments after this. It like, might be Jernay, but um, she, 
I can't believe that show got canceled. Oh, the the Lovecraft. I yeah, love I Lovecraft. Know. You don't cancel show. that. They got canceled. You. Lovecraft they, got canceled. They have a they have a vendetta yeah, against her because yeah. every show she's in is amazing, and it only go, they always cancel them. And it, it's up for so many Emmy awards because it's a miraculous show. I need to tell you about a show that um, I was talking about before we even started, and it's Miss Pat. Yeah, um, you were talking about that when I was out of the room, and. I just had her on my podcast, mm -hmm. and she is so special mm -hmm. because she came from similar to, if you want to compare it to Richard's roots, mm -hmm. she came from hell. Mm -hmm. You know, she she didn't have a dad. Her mom was an alcoholic. She got shot. She shot. Mm. She went to jail. She's an amazingly funny person, and so she has a show that is out on BET Plus, mm -hmm. And I watched the pilot, and Norman Lear called her because he saw the pilot. Norman mm -hmm. Lear, all in the family, Jefferson's. Yeah. He said, you're doing, he told her, and I'm paraphrasing because these are her words. He said, you're doing what we couldn't do. Wow. And it is so special. Lee Daniels held on to it and exec produced it, and Brian Grazer, mm. and Debbie Allen directed the pilot. Oh, wow. And it is top heavy with it's all talent star, and all star Allen situation. And, Lee Daniels and it is, him. and it and it's. I hate to say A-listers. It's so gross, but but she is doing her life, and it is real, and it is hilarious, and it brings up issues that you you would find very sensitive years ago. But right. things have to be talked about, you know? Now, speaking of good shows and shows being canceled. <laughs> right? I was good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Full House. Um, the story, the official line is it was canceled because of rising costs. Are those rising costs salaries of the actors? Because the show went out like like 14 times more successful than any show of that year. Like it yeah. was crushing the competition when it was canceled. Yeah. You hear about that. It it was renegotiation time because mm -hmm. it was, you know, we did eight years. Mm -hmm. And the question was, do you want to renegotiate? Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And yet, if it had that share today, but the world's completely different. Yeah. You know, we're in a streaming world where people do if, selective yeah. viewing. If it had that share today, that's like a religion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it, it was huge. Um, we didn't know it was getting canceled. Neither so. did we. They didn't even cancel it with a good last episode. Like, she just fell off the horse and it disappeared. It's like... And that wasn't the last one we shot. The last one we shot was a two-parter where Steve shows up, Scott Weinger, and that was the one that was... It was a two-parter. <laughs> was it, this a memory loss one? Well, the was I don't remember because I had the last one we loss. saw was the memory Did, loss one. Was the memory loss one? Two, was that a two parter? That and a Steve comes in at the end. At the, oh, at the end of the. Then that yeah, was it was the, a two. -part. That was fucking freaky. Yeah, it was. It was like scary. I remember. I don't want a kid to fall off a horse. It right. was. It was really, and it wasn't like a a, a do, 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 do type of thing. It was just like, oh my god, no, I oh. cried. Like that was that was. You started to deal with the show. Started to deal with like heavier issues yeah. as it went on. It has to because it has to grow Make at some point, right? But I remember. I watched that recently when I found out we were going to inter interview you. So I was like, I'm going to watch the first episode and the last episode. I watched a bunch in between, but I was like, I'm going to watch the first episode of Full House and the last two episodes. And I remember watching it like, I don't, I don't want this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I don't want this to happen to Michelle. Right. As a, as a fan of the show, I'm like, mm -hmm. can she just get her memory back so we could go back to having good times? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, can we get go back to giving each other hugs and shit like that? Right, and she, I remember when she got her memory back, I was like, "Oh, finally!" But I guess that was the emotional ride they wanted to take you on at that. Point. I kind of disconnected because that's brain trauma. Yeah, you know, if you're gonna play it for what it is, so I I would say that I wish we could have had a do over on that. <laughs> right. Please, you know? like I well, the twins don't want to be. Well, I don't. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, because I, I don't mind talking about that. Okay, well, you know, obviously, because I'm friends with them. Through and Fuller I love House, them. they had all the the jokes about them not wanting to, you know, be in it and stuff like that. But we are owed a new last episode. Like it was just, I, no one knew it was canceled. And I remember, like, I kept looking. I'm like, there's no, there's nothing coming back. Like, what, what's going on? Well, the, the truth of it is, when Fuller House did that tongue in cheek thing, I. I didn't really like it. Uh, I'm just being honest. I, the breaking the fourth wall thing. I, yeah. I didn't like it. I mean, I I I loved being with everybody, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I. If you look at my look into camera, I was trying to give love to the girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that. 
That's what I, I was doing that. because I will always love everybody from that show. Everybody. Right. And I love Ashley Mary Kate and I've stayed close with them our entire career, their entire lives. And they they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And I I don't think you owe things to your fans when you were a Absolutely child not. actor. Absolutely and not. And they've become their their fashion line, the row, is like my wife buys their stuff. I mean, it's I wish I I wish they had a men's line. I mean, it's such beautiful stuff. They're so good at what they do and they're mm -hmm. absolutely enabled wonderful strong bright women. I mean, they had and to they be. They built an empire. Um, um they took what was what was what they earned, what was given to them and what they earned and turned it into something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, Dave uh, Couillet said something in an interview that I thought was very interesting that I never considered. He said, when we were all hanging out doing the show, they were babies. Yeah. So their experience is different as far as the way that they treat the cast of the show and, and what it means to them. It's like they were, they were li literal babies. They were uh, nine when the show ended. Yeah. I mean, I changed their diapers, right. you know? And then um, we... They're so wonderful and so generous, for example. When I did a Scleroderma Research Foundation benefit in New York, mm -hmm. they uh, arranged f for uh, one of the auction items for someone to get a tour of the row and wow. for someone to go through how they do everything. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about it. Our, our board was just talking about how incredibly it's they've priceless. been so generous. And, and it's been hilarious to right. watch auctions. You know, Conan <laughs> and I were on stage one night and the girls were there, and he's like, this is so awkward. <laughs> you know, we're bidding for your TV daughter's right. uh, clothing line. It was, um, they're just really special. And But I have love for all those people, and, it, and it's not something I take lightly. You right. know? They did so much and as children that some people have, are not gonna do their whole life. So it's right. like, they've given us more than enough. Before we move on, one more about Full House. And um, so comedians, including yourself, call Full House corny. Actually, um, I was telling Tyler this in the car the other day. I had no – I was corny because of Full House. I would take the, 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 the sayings on Full House and go try them out at school. Didn't work too well. <laughs> um, but obviously everyone loved the show. It was so endearing. And what do you think – what was the quality that made everyone just fall in love with Full House? I think, um, and it's it's a testament to it that it's like the only family show that has never gone off the air since mm -hmm. it uh, premiered. Mm -hmm. Always got picked up somewhere. Mm -hmm. Little kids would call it the Michelle show mm -hmm. because once uh, the girls, they would give everybody a part of the show. Everybody mm -hmm. would have their own episode. But to go out on a commercial break with Michelle going, I don't know. Right. What am I going to do when the synthesizer music plays? Right. And then they come back from the break and we're concerned about what Michelle's right. going through. No one was giving a in a in a real heartfelt way a 3 4 year old's perspective. Mm. And so once um the girls be, spoke and and were really eloquent, it it was a a fascinating thing that you would go through Joey's point of view, which would be about Bullwinkle right. <laughs> or, right. or Danny, you know, cause right. his wife, it's based on a sad premise. Yeah. So that's another thing I think that made the show so lovable. It's like a Disney movie where there's, there's no mom mm -hmm. that keeps going. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also about the family that keeps going. And you're growing with them. You're seeing people change and grow physically and mentally, spiritually mm -hmm. as they get older. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we came back, when they did the show, which is really about Candace and Jody and Andrea yeah, yeah. Uh, being enabled women, it mm -hmm. still had a tongue-in-cheek homage to the old show. So yeah. it, it wasn't always it, it, as strong as it was. And in six years on Netflix, uh, six seasons is a lot on yeah. Netflix. It still didn't and, – and it dealt with stories, but it did a lot of musical numbers. It mm -hmm. did sort of Full House. But Full House was based more in how am I going to get through – and, and how am I going to get through life? And the silliness of bringing in a guy that does impressions like a clown right. and a guy that's basically, uh, you know, a teen idol, handsome right. guy, okay. my brother-in-law, who is, you know, he's a, he's a it was kind of like I was Richie from Happy Days. He was Fonzie, he was Fonzie. and Dave was Potsy or Potsy, Ralph. Right, right, right. You know. Mixed together. Yeah, and Michelle was like Tom Bosley or something. I don't <laughs> know. All seeing, all knowing. Right, right. You were talking about you didn't like that sort of, 
nod to the twins in the debut episode of Fuller House. Right. Um, and I want to try. And my- I wasn't myself on that debut episode. I uh, I was <laughs> I was on two Claritin. <laughs> oh. This is me. This I'm is gonna me. go back and watch it again. This is me on over the counter. Uh, I'm gonna have to watch it again too because it felt like I mean I was just so excited to see it coming back. I yeah, didn't right? notice. Right. Welcome to Over the Counter. <laughs> <laughs> Actors who were doing over the counter stuff while they were doing a show. I have a song called it, Over the Counter. That could be the theme song. That would be that should yeah. be it. And you just show clips of me wandering around in the first episode. <laughs> I think the concept of Fuller House was cool because it was just rever- it was just women. It was That's pretty much the same the same thing, only now it's showing from the woman's point of view. So now it was perfect. I don't <laughs> It that's perfect. it. That's nice to hear, yeah. and I think the girls they would have done it forever. They yeah. loved it a lot, and I've spent a lot of time with them. In fact, there was a dinner recently that it was uh, my wife uh, Kelly and Jeff Franklin, mm-hmm. and it was Candace and Jody and Andrea and uh, Lori, and we had we had a nice dinner, really okay. nice. Now, um, speaking of Laurie, she made the news as well recently. Yes, she did. Um, on the debut of Fuller House, she's making a joke about not wanting to pay for college for the kids. I don't remember that. Yeah. I don't remember the exact verbiage of the joke, but that's like the last joke she makes in the first scene. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to have, like, take the away twins. the kids and, and bring them back. You know, I don't want to have to pay for college. I think you're the first person that has brought this up ever. Anywhere. I'm going to look. I mean, this. so this happened like a couple of years. This episode was a couple of years before the situation. But right. I just think that's very interesting and serendipitous. I, it is uh, It is art uh, pre-imitating live. Yeah. I will say that, uh, and I've said it because mm-hmm. people were always, you know, before COVID, you'd have TMZ around every corner. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's where your big interviews come. I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't do mobile interviews. Right. But all, <laughs> I, I, all I, you know, <laughs> right? They, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch my car from the airport. What do you... <laughs> Put me in a chair or on a couch. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Let's go with a couple cameras. Right. <laughs> But I just a my answer is I love who I love and mm-hmm. I yeah. love her yeah, and of she's she's a wonderful person mm-hmm. uh, and that's it yeah. you know people go through shit nobody yeah. I gets, got friends who go through shit too Me we too. all <laughs> do yeah. we all do and we're in a canceling time where you could I could say something here you could say something mm-hmm. but you can't get canceled because you're so they you, tried it didn't work they really try every day. <laughs> I don't know if you know Do this about really? me, but they, they try to cancel me a lot. <laughs> uh, they were trying to cancel me over jokes that I told that they take it out of context, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't do them today. Right. And I'm sorry they exist on. But tape. in the context of what of the time, that's what you know. Comedians, comedians, obviously can't apologize. It's something that we've established because we've had so many comedians on this show, but um. Comedians do grow, mm-hmm. which is why you're saying, okay, I'm not going to apologize, but I can grow. Well, it was funny. Yes. I mean, I wrote a book called Dirty Daddy. Yeah, which, you did. And, and that in that book, I told a story about something, a few stories, mm-hmm. because I thought that sells books. And they went, oh, tell a story. So I embellished a mm-hmm. thing that happened on the set, which I don't want to talk about because mm-hmm. it's just, and I apologized. It's in the book. Mm-hmm. But they don't, I mean, I, I apologize right away. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't have done this. It was stupid. It was like a 10 second thing. Mm-hmm. That we're not going to talk about with okay. a with a stunt doll, but anyway, um, but we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> but I would, I mean, I'm I'm the one that cancels myself. Right. You know? I shouldn't, have, you know, I didn't have to say I did something that disgusting mm-hmm. and stupid, but it wasn't done in a disgusting way, even though it was, and now definitely is perceived that way. Mm-hmm. But I, I am sorry for people that have been through terrible stuff, but comedians. If you look at a lot of comedy mm-hmm. uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and watch how comedians worked or watch comedy movies, a lot of times people would say stuff in the movie that you would deem racist today mm-hmm. or deem, oh, my God, that's pedophilic or mm-hmm. that's violation of someone. But the point of the that comedy then was trying to go, look how horrible this is, so I'm mm-hmm. going to point it out and do that joke. And then you go, whoa! But they don't. But that intention doesn't travel, and it doesn't do well with time. And it's not even part of my consciousness now to do a joke like that. Mm-hmm. You know. And Sarah Silverman talked about this. You know, I would not do that joke today. Mm-hmm. But it was a time where you're calling it out. 
Chappelle says that the reason that he did Sticks and Stones is precisely what you're talking about. Sticks and Stones starts with him doing jokes about, you know, if I was a, if I was a pedophile, Macaulay Kit Coughlin's the first kid I'm fucking. Right. And he's like, the point of that joke is, well, clearly I'm not fucking kids. Mm -hmm. That's the whole and the point. And it's a horrible thing to do. Yeah. But he's also saying that Macaulay is adorable. <laughs> right. Because right. he is. Right, right. But not, not sexually. Right, right. But if you're going to use a famous name, I mean, that's also, uh, you know... And I know Macaulay, and I, I love the guy. Right. So it's just, it's um, it's hard to explain to people levels. And we are in a sensitive time where I, I feel I have to be conscious. And I do something that happened naturally. So this whole thing with Yellow Springs and mm -hmm. Dave um, and my closeness with him is really, and my friendship with Bill Burr, it, the, the, the people that are trying to you know, shake people up or say something that yeah, this isn't going to go over well mm -hmm. when you hear comedians say that, or, you know, right. don't cancel me over this, but mm -hmm. I'm going to say, if you tee it up properly, it takes some of the onus off of it. If it's funny. Yeah. If it's funny, but if it's meant as a, uh, yeah. if it's a gross out, then it's, it, it ain't going to work. Right. I can't do anything now, uh, touching on pedophilia where I used to do jokes. My, one of my first jokes mm -hmm. when I was 17 mm -hmm. or 18 was I have the brain of a German shepherd and the body of a 16-year-old boy, and they're both in my car, and I want you to see them. <laughs> right. And that's like, that's a kid in the trunk of your car. <laughs> fucking mm -hmm. crazy. That's not something wrong with me. When you was on the Dangerfield <laughs> show, you said, uh, you said, my new girlfriend, I'm, I'm nuts over her. She's this tall. <laughs> and that's an old joke. <laughs> yes, that yeah. was an old joke. Yeah. But, but those jokes, you know, people still love them. But I don't do stuff I used to right. do. That's what I love about stand-up. That's what you love about... It's always, You're always inventing something new mm -hmm. and, and ground you haven't broken before. And I'm really proud of the work I'm doing now. And I'm very conscious of the work I've done. I'm trying to just to move forward. Right. I'm hoping that with the cancel culture... Because the point of it was to point out racist, right? And yes. sexist. Oh, racism, that was sexism. The point. So rape, what I'm rape culture. I do rape, yeah, culture. rape culture. I think I do think that cancel culture has really gone above and beyond, especially as a comedian, because it's like, you know, we we laugh at inappropriate things that people want to laugh about. They just wouldn't say them out loud. That's like mm -hmm. the whole point. But I'm hoping that, you know, as it's heightened right now to weed these people out, that it'll go back to the norm. To where it's like, okay, we don't think this person is racist because they're saying a racy joke. Or we don't think this person's a rapist because they're saying, oh gosh, <laughs> recorded me talking. Um, we don't think this person is rapy because they said like a, you know, a roofie joke or something like that. It's just seen as comedy, but we have to weed these people out. So it's like a give and a take with the well, whole cancel culture. I think here's the problem. The problem when sort of progressive academic language is whittled down to being woke. And you have average, and when I say average, I'm not, it's not a judgment call. I'm just talking about, you know, the, the norm of what people are. Most people don't have the recent, uh, uh, experience to be speaking in these high-minded, highfalutin academic terms. Right. And these terms now become mainstream and people are flinging them around and people are forming like victim bond sessions and people are like getting the endorphins of feeling like a better, I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you call someone out on social media, that has a lot to do with it. You start getting likes, likes. Mm -hmm. Well, then you start getting addicted to that. Yeah. That, and that's ego. And that yeah, that's takes all, all the lightness out of life. That's right. You're not going to have a happy day. Right. You are just going to be on alert. You're yeah. you're a watchdog mm -hmm. to try to cause um, and and yes they they do hit upon uh, correct assumptions right and in addition to they they sometimes not only are they often correct I mean we start start talking about rape culture and all that stuff like the data says w for the most part. For the vast majority of the time, women aren't lying about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, as a man, I've had people come. And they've at me been with, afraid to come out, I mean, right? It, they don't right. even test rape kits. You know, they don't even look, check check the rape kits. I've had people make all types of crazy accusations against me. They haven't slowed me down as a performer, as a man, and I feel like that's my male privilege. Right. I feel like if I was uh, responsible for any of the things they're accusing me of, it would be different. So you've been accused of actual actions. Yeah. Absolutely. I've been accused of things I've said mm -hmm. 
and people that see like the roast that they roasted me. Yeah, the me, roast, yeah. And and how people did a lot of those kind of jokes, mm -hmm. which I didn't like, and right. I didn't want them at who they were directed at. But they You looked, did tell them to suck your $100 million cock at the end. Though. I did do that. Yes, you did. You but let that was know. to the, the dais. That yeah, was to I know. all the I knew comedians. What that was. But, but a lot of the people, a lot of the, the Gen Z, mm -hmm. who I want, who are the future, mm -hmm. so I don't want them to be like this, yeah. are looking at a roast... And they're saying, well, if they're doing jokes about this, it's got to be true. Right. Like, I'm sorry. It's not the news. It's jokes. And that's right. the point I'm making is that when people people are now presenting themselves as scholarly experts, as academic experts, all this stuff, and comedy, for it to be good comedy, has to not be academic. It has to be based on generalizations. When I, when I see a, a great... Comedian says black people act like this, or white people act like this, or gay people act like this, or right. women women be shopping. Like all this stuff is clearly not based on actual data exactly. and facts. It's based on stereotype. It's based on generalization. It's based on the society. And that's how this culture does move that needle forward. Mm -hmm. It stops the. It, it allows a new way mm -hmm. to look at people, mm -hmm. and you can usually be safe if you're talking about your own group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how it's been traditionally. And and I and, uh, I and agree a, a great with comic it. though is someone who I think this is what makes, um, you know, Dave so great and so beloved amongst so many different diverse groups of people, and yourself as well. I mean, you did a uh, an event with Burner. Burner's hilarious. He named himself after a phone. <laughs> <laughs> But Cypher Sounds tells me that you, you, he said, we go to do this weed event and it's all these comedians and the whole audience is stoned. So he said, everyone was bombing. He said, and he said, I had my eyes trained on this one black guy with a blunt in his mouth who didn't laugh at anything. Yeah. Right. He said, and then Bob Saget gets up there. And I pointed, I knew that, I figured it out. Mm -hmm. it, I'm 65. Mm -hmm. I've been doing stand up for 40 million years. Right. I go to an event. I see they're all stoned. They can't right. move. It's mm -hmm. the best pot. Right. Um, and San Francisco, pray for that city. Downtown's not <laughs> right, in a right. good place. Right. We're on top of a building living this strange uh, altered reality on 420. I see a guy not laughing, but I see that he's smiling. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're stoned, I told them, I told the audience, you're smiling, I'm crushing. Right. Right now. And then they started to actually vocally laugh. Right. And then I said, are you all right? Are you unhappy? To this gentleman. Mm -hmm. And he went, no, I'm, I'm good. He woke up. Yeah, Cypher said, he was like, <laughs> but you know. yeah. and then And then it was, it was I had a, a wonderful time. And that's what Dave knows. And that's, Dave's full of love. Mm -hmm. So Dave Chappelle, at his root, is love. Mm -hmm. And he feels the pain mm -hmm. of humanity. And what the hell are we going to do? And so the root of who I am, as older I get, is love. Mm. And yeah, I'm not always like that. I'm disgruntled at home or mm. I'll watch the news and I'll yell. You know, I'll get really upset about stuff. Mm. But if you are coming from a place of love and you're a good person, mm -hmm. uh, people think Bill Burr is all angry. Right. This guy's so full of love. He is. He really is. He's so special. Yeah, he really so, is. So, you know, that's... That's the key, and that's why I'm more inspired to do stand up now than mm. ever. I wow. mean, to go out to, and I'm going to places you're at. I'm going to uh, St. Louis. Okay. And, yeah, I got St. Louis uh, and you're going into New York, I saw. Yeah. You're going into like Brooklyn Bowl. I'm and doing Brooklyn Bowl for a few nights in September. Are you doing Brooklyn Bowl? No, but I love Brooklyn Bowl. You should come through. I would I would love to go when you're there. Yeah. I'm somewhere, but I, I, I looked at where you're touring. I want to come see you. I just did Blue Note for three nights, and I saw Robert Glasper was there the week before. He had Dave and Chris Rock come up and do mm. bits before the show. And then he had Mo Amer come up as well, because Robert's a Houston guy. Right. Mo's a Houston guy. So I was inspired by that, and I had uh, Cypher Sounds and, and Will Silvents come up and warm up the crowd. Oh. And did you forget about your own set that you did? <laughs> People are telling me that my first set back, because it was my first hour plus set back after a year and a half because of the pandemic. Right. And I was so nervous that I was so, I had to relearn the songs because it was all muscle memory. I, I was I, like, even get by. I had to relearn get by. So I was like, <laughs> for real, it was like, show. And so I, but I was so nervous that I was going to fuck up. That I was like, I got to just tell the crowd about what I'm going through. Uh, but I've been hanging out with comedians all summer. So I just told the crowd, I said, I'm terrified and then I guess I started doing bits. He did set up punch, set up punch. <laughs> That's I'm sitting hilarious. there. I'm like, is someone doing stand up right now? 
I know. Like, and then he got up. I'm like, oh, so you're a comedian now? And he was like, no, I'm just but talking. But that I'm took like, the I'm, edge off because the truth is. Wh- it was just the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I knew enough about stagecraft and I've seen comedians go through the process that I knew how to tell the truth in a way that was efficient. Mm-hmm. It was about those efficient containers for me. I love the Blue Note in yeah. New York. Yeah. That, I would have loved to have seen that. I love Will. I, I already booked it. I'm doing it next April, that same three nights. Oh, my God. It was an amazing April show. next year. Oh, I'll, I'll go to that. Yeah. I'll go to that. Yeah. Because that's, you know, it's interesting. I had trouble coming back, too, and mm-hmm. learning my stuff. And then, but I, I'm free associating anyway. I was scared that night in right Springs. before uh, in Yellow Springs. Mm-hmm. And Michelle Wolf was on, and Louis C.K. was backstage, mm-hmm. and... I had Dave there, and I said, I, "What do I do? I I got an abortion joke, and I don't know what to do." And Dave and Louis simultaneously said, "Open with it," <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "I don't know," and I did it. Right. And it got quiet. There were some tumbleweeds, and mm-hmm. then a third of the crowd was laughing because right. um, it was not meant to. It was meant to be one of those things that yeah. you're trying to let the air out of the balloon. Yeah. But that was the night you keep bringing up Mo. Mo Amer mm-hmm. is the person that, uh, in in Dave's documentary, which mm-hmm. is a, an amazing piece of work. Yes, um, that was the night that we found out that Mo had COVID. Yeah. And oh, he was the COVID one. He yeah. was the one, and it it he shut. He was it. our outbreak monkey. Mm. And, <laughs> monkey, t- <laughs> he was a, he was I can say it. I'm black. Yes, you can. That outbreak monkey in the movie. I'm sorry <laughs> wait, to go wait, Bob, you don't say that, it. I'm just going to say no, but, it. We don't want any problems. No, but I'm just saying mm-hmm. on the refrigerator. That's the only thing. I believe everything in the outbreak, Mm -hmm. the piece of phlegm they follow through the theater, (laughs) the air vent catches it, puts it in another guy's Mm -hmm. mouth. It's gross, but it's Mm -hmm. how this stuff Mm -hmm. gets uh, spread. But then they just see the kids drawing on the refrigerator with crayons, Mm -hmm. and that's how they discover that it's (laughs) the monkey that's that. (laughs) That was like, wait a minute. That's not even a courtroom (laughs) artist sketch. That was the only plot point that, that threw me. Dustin Hoffman was in that movie, right? He was. It didn't matter. It's and it's a, it's a special movie. Yeah. <laughs> but back to Mo. So this is what happened. So Jeff Wills, the Live Nation, and myself, we leave that mm-hmm. next day with my wife. And that was the day of the little thing that I did in the documentary, mm-hmm. sitting with Dave. We're all sad. Dave is feeling bad, right. but he also accepts closure mm-hmm. and knows that, well, it was meant to end now then. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, Bob, when we come back, you'll be the first person I'm going to call. And I was. Yeah, I was, was the first yeah, of the four. But th- this is what I did. Now, you, I don't think you know this. Did you get a JPEG? Did you get sent a picture from that night? Okay. Oh, yeah, from the night from the night when you came back? No. no. The night that, that yes. Mo was uh, diagnosed with covid I'm on the plane, uh-huh. and uh, we were sent by Matthew, the mm-hmm. fantastic photographer. Mm-hmm. I think I said his name right. Matthew, yes. <laughs> Breton. Breton. And he, he is a hell of a photographer. Oh, he's amazing. It's ridiculous. I mean, right. Prince and Lenny Candy Kravitz. Candy Man. Man. Oh, Candy T Man. He was super IG. sweet, too. He yeah. is. He is. And he came down with it, too, after that. But anyway, um, I'm on the plane. And I get sent a picture by him uh-huh. of the whole group. And Mo is above Dave and myself and everybody. Right. We're all standing there. So what I did was I took on the iPhone that little markup thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I had green <laughs> shit coming out of his nose. <laughs> I drew green shit coming out of his nose and mouth into my mouth and Dave's mouth. And I sent it to Dave. And I sent it, I started, I sent it to Mo. Right. And, I, and Dave apparently circulated it. And because it was hilarious, because that's, that's like that's what comedians do. Because other people would be horrified. Right. Are you going to hurt their feelings? Or oh my god, this is we're going to die. Right. We're not going to die, mm-hmm. uh, but this is this bad. And this is how we're right. going to deal with the pain. That's uh, that. And some people would be offended. It's best by medicine. It. That's <laughs> what I think. Mm-hmm. So that same time. When I found out Dave had COVID, I texted him and I said, you should have did the show in a glass box. And he was like, LMAO, next time. And then I was like, oh, and I hope you're okay, too. (laughs) Right. His health comes second. (laughs) First is a good joke. Oh, wait. Say that again? Oh, wait. You changed it. Oh, move on. (laughs) No, you did a good joke. Thank you. I just wanted to hear that. (laughs) Yeah, right. Oh, oh, that was it. Yeah, if you're getting an LOL from Dave, you're, you're doing well. You just gave us the news. Can we say it? The news about Dirty Work 2? 
Well, it's not news. It's mm-hmm. not happened yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are in, in the process of, of uh, securing uh, financing. Until mm-hmm. that happens, it, it ain't a movie yet. Right. That's the truth. But David Permit uh, is a dear friend, and he's a, an amazing filmmaker, and he's uh, he's producing, and I'd be directing, and there's a script, and Norm is... Uh, telling much more than I should because it's not anything right now. <laughs> well, it's let's still, just talk about Dirty Work. Showbiz is right? hearsay right? until it's happening. Well, but the we can movie, t- the original, is Norm MacDonald, Artie Lang, um, uh, everybody else who's in the movie. It's, uh, Adam it's, Sandler, Gary Coleman, John it, Goodman. It's, it's You know a lot. It's, Rebecca. It, uh, Romaine Stamos. Yeah. That's credit. <laughs> <laughs> that's the name in the credit. And... Um, it was uh, cr- the beautiful Chris Farley's beautiful last Chris film. Farley. Yeah. And he's hilarious in it. And Jack Warden and Chris McDonald. Don Rickles. Don Rickles. So this is like this is like monument to comedy. And it it opened and didn't do well. It was right. an MGM movie and MGM didn't promote it that good. The poster said coming soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it never had a date. And it opened the night Michael Jordan was playing his last two games. Mm-hmm. With the Bulls. And mm. the movie was made for 17-year-old guys that right. watch Norm MacDonald mm-hmm. on on uh, Update. Right. On SNL. And so it didn't it didn't do well. But I just looked this morning, because we're, you know, we're working business to get the movie, to get a sequel made. Mm-hmm. And Dirty Work, all of a sudden, it, it just came out. It's on Apple TV. It's on Hulu. It's on HBO Max. Mm-hmm. And it's on Amazon. And it was nowhere. A month ago, it oh, was I like- Oh, I know, because I watched it to get prepared for this interview, and I bought it on iTunes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, he said this morning, it's on streaming everywhere. Right. But it just <laughs> happened. Yeah. It was so interesting that I was looking it up, because I was talking to this, uh, you know, talking to people. Mm-hmm. Talking to Bitcoin people. No, talk, <laughs> talking to real wonderful people. <laughs> Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. <laughs> talking to people that believe all that. Right. Do you believe all that? That's a, that's a good question, because- you know, myself and Yasin Bey have a group, Black Star, and we have an album that we want to release. But he's not into streaming at all because he doesn't like the business arrangement. So we've been talking about different things, and he's very excited about NFTs. Right. You know, I'm, I've am i been working on a couple of NFT things, but I just don't know. I don't know enough about the market to be excited about it. And I'm not pure. I don't really give a shit about it. Right. My yeah, interest in right. it is purely based on can I cause someone gonna give me some money. Right. Did and you if buy- you're not gonna give me some money, I don't care about reading about your fucking articles. I don't I don't wanna read the NFT Bible. Is am I gonna cause someone gonna give me money? I'm in the same place. Yeah. So, you know, maybe they're right or maybe they're it'll go the way of, you know, the dodo bird. I don't know. Right. Some people call it a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And I don't know. I do think though there's there's talk about it being not safe for the environment. Right, because of all the computers that it Yeah, takes. but that to me, I will say, in defense of it, that to me sounds like hateration. Like, that's not because, so these other systems are good for the environment? None of them are good for None the None of them are good for the right. environment. Right, anybody that, computers aren't used to just trade money? Yeah, what are, you, what are y'all talking about? What's the stock market? Yeah, see, that seems like a red herring or just like a something to just, but yeah, I'm I'm not completely sold. But um, where did may, the expression "red herring" come from? I don't know. We should Google that. It's I mean, probably uh, racist. It, uh. I don't. Well, it, it, to herrings, maybe. Right, it's probably, right. probably all herrings are gray. But right. there was one red one. He they got so, rid of him. He was problematic. So did, did y'all buy? I think so. Coin? Y'all didn't buy it. Okay. I didn't. But it was a very funny thing. Yeah, the whole trying to explain it. Yeah. And that's what that's where I'm at mentally. I just don't. I don't get it. Maybe I should. I have some friends that are doing it and love it, and and they're making money. But it, there's well, it's not money yet. I'm like, well, what? When when is it money? Do you I made sixty bucks. You made sixty bucks. And the litcoin. Why is, is that it? different? Litecoin. Sorry. Um, I don't know why it's different. I don't know. I just know that some years ago, someone was like, "Oh, get this," and I got it. And I looked at it when the whole Dogecoin thing was going. I was like, "Oh, I made sixty bucks. I put in, I think, twenty bucks." Don't spend it all in one place, right? I can't even. Yeah, right. <laughs> I just looked up red herring. It's from British fox hunters. Well, it's from my co- my people. No, it's no. not from your people. She does a horrible British accent. I don't encourage. It's not behavior. horrible at all. It's what terrible. Do you think? Um, the term red herring has been around since 1420. Describe the smoked version of fish, apparently 
Uh, smoked and salted herrings turn bright red in a curing process and emit a punch of fishy smell. And to catch foxes, they used to drag dead cats across the trail. When they couldn't drag a dead cat, they'd fool the fox by using red herrings. So I, red herring yeah, is a distraction guess, or right. a mislead. I, whoever got that into the vernacular back then was a genius. I don't. Know. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't sound like it's just a stinky fish. <laughs> it's just a stinky fish. <laughs> right. Um, let's talk about how I met your mother. Yeah. Which. I really like Neil Patrick Harris, Jason Segel. Everybody, Love them all. everybody, Love them all. the cast is fantastic of the show. Yeah, and it's a type of show where I don't really like a lot of the CBS sitcoms, right? But there was a type of thing where it was like that sitcom was just undeniable. In in the sitcom vehicle, mm-hmm. the the writing and the, the 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 acting was just undeniable. It was like I turned it on and I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Mm-hmm. And the whole time it was on, I did not know it was you. People say that. Being, and if you're in another Irish. country and everybody's dubbed and it's not English, I ain't there. But you still got paid. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I, was, no, I don't maybe know about it. Maybe, maybe. Maybe because it has both soundtracks. Right. I don't know. But the truth of that is, I, and I still, there are people that are so late to the program mm-hmm. that they will go, why is Bob Saget narrating Josh Radner's voice? That's right. like the big question. Right. That's what I asked when they asked me to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and Pam Fryman is an exec producer and the, and a director of all of them. Mm-hmm. And the guys that made it are brilliant writers and wonderful men. Mm-hmm. It's Carter Bays and Craig Thomas. Mm-hmm. And they were college friends and they're they're just brilliant guys such a great premise and Mm -hmm. it it is and i read the pilot i was doing a play in new york and i i said this is lovely this is a romantic comedy Mm -hmm. this is a harry met sally this is friends it's kind of like friends but it's in a bar and it's it's more romantic it's more about relationships and friendships and and it had that feeling of and they knew what the ending was going to be. That's the other big woo-hoo. right. Why did they do that? The lead up to that last episode was really brilliant. How they rolled that out. I I agree. And um and they're the creators of it. And but people are always mad at something mm-hmm. because it didn't. Or well, the fans had something to say. To they you. were angry. They oh, were okay. angry because it got sad. I mean, I also liked the last episode of Game of Thrones. So I'm always in the minority. I did too. Yeah, I didn't have a problem. Uh, with I, it. And people go, "Oh, they should redo it." What they what they needed was a longer version of it because mm-hmm. it was like little bullet points of where all the where oh, the everybody Game of is. Was horrible. Well, hey, I understand. relax with that slander. No, not the show. Oh, God. The, 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 the not the episode. show. Okay. The last episode. And I'll I was, allow it. I'll allow it. I was actually <laughs> holding my ears because I love how I met my how I met your mother, and I have not seen the last episode, oh, so well, I did not want it. For, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> well. I would rather You're, be surprised on my couch. Do you watch instead. it? Do you like watch it? Oh, I love and that And you just show. haven't yeah. gotten to it. I haven't yet. gotten, well, I the, haven't seen the last. It's not unlike the last episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh. Okay. It has a similarity. How I Met Your Mother is this amazing thing. And they said, we'd love you to narrate it. And I said, well, why don't you just have Josh narrate it? Mm-hmm. They said, no, we want his voice to sound older, mm-hmm. your familiar voice. And I went, so you want him to sound like he smoked cigars and drank? <laughs> uh, can't he just do that for the narration? Right. And they, they said, no, we think it's a, a fit. And I went in and did it I in the it way Daniel too. Stern did one year years and Ron Howard did Arrested. Mm-hmm. And not getting credit. I don't want to credit. Chris Rock did Everybody Hates Chris. Oh, yeah. perfectly. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, he had to. Yeah. Well, his voice is, you know, you yeah. start laughing when you hear it. Yeah. But, but then I went and did it, and I really spent time on every episode. I would watch an episode in 20th Century Fox on a soundstage, four hours, six hours to record it, and I became friends with Josh Radner, mm-hmm. and we shared a lot of similarities. That's of, dope. I did Full House, and he did that. We're playing these characters that are kind of the glue, mm-hmm. and yet we're feeling like, oh, but I'm not getting... You know, Actors complain if they're, work, if they're working or not working, mm-hmm. yeah. no matter what. But he also is brilliant and lovely and also understands how lucky we are yeah. when we get a job. And that one... I mean, the cast... I knew the cast. Allison Hannigan used to be my babysitter wow. for my oldest daughter. So I was there when they did the last episode. I won't tell you what the last Thank episode you. was. Wow. But uh, on the DVD box set, which are, DVDs are so popular right now, <laughs> but uh, NFTs are more popular than DVDs. The DVDs. I don't even know But I, I, I do, do narrate the last episode, <laughs> not Josh Radner, who narrates the last episode, which I thought was brilliant that he did. But if you want to hear me narrate the last episode, that will it's disappoint on the extra. you. Uh, That's you can, great. You can get the DVD box set That's on great. eBay. That's dope. I actually <laughs> looked up 
to see whose voice it was because it sounded familiar. But right. I didn't know the voice, so I looked it up. I like to know the voice right. of gods. I'm very proud that I was a small part of that show. That cast is, you know. Wonderful. Yeah. When did the Aristocrats come out? Was 15 years ago? Oh, my God. Ago? Yeah. So when this came out, I went to see it. And um, I didn't know anything about it. I might have met Dave, but I wasn't friends with comedians. I wasn't going to comedy clubs. I didn't understand comedy as a, as an art. I liked, you know, Deaf Comedy Jam. Right. I thought that was funny, you know. But I didn't really understand the art of it. So when I saw The Aristocrats, I remember it was the film made a lot of noise, and Gilbert Gottfried had told the joke and upset everybody, and then the yeah. film comes out. I didn't get it at all. Right. I was like, who are all these white comedians and why are they so disgusting? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, Chris Rock's in it, but he doesn't tell the joke. He doesn't want right. to deal Whoopi's with it. Right, Whoopi's in it. Yeah, um, she but, doesn't tell the joke. But that's not, yeah, she doesn't tell Jerry the joke. Jerry Seinfeld doesn't tell the joke. Right. People are going, Robin Williams tells a different joke. Right, he tells a different joke. You didn't joke. just come here to hunt. Right. But what I what I noticed about it, so I rewatched it recently because I know you, the way you tell the joke made waves. It was the second time I'd ever told the joke. Mm-hmm. I'd only heard it once mm. from a comedian, Dom Herrera. And yeah, myself, Sarah Silverman, and Gilbert mm-hmm. were cited. Um, and it's in Newsweek, and it's in all yeah. this stuff. And it was supposed to be, as George Carlin narrated it, about freedom of speech. Yeah. And it was supposed to be about a joke that you don't tell. You right. tell behind a dumpster. And it ain't a joke. It's not a good joke. It's a horrible right. joke. It's about the worst thing that exists. Uh, which is incest, Mm -hmm. kind of, and excrement and Mm -hmm. disgusting. Mm -hmm. The whole point of it was, let's say, all the worst things we possibly can, Mm -hmm. and then the punchline is, after this family does terrible stuff, we're the aristocrats, which isn't even a... It's not anything. But that's what I think is the most interesting part about it, Mm -hmm. is that the joke is disgusting and can be offensive, but... It's not about, and the joke is not like a lot of comedians said it's not even a good joke, but it's about what I got watching it now. We were, I watched it a few days ago, and I totally understood. Are you understood, okay? I understood it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a lot. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot. But I understood it way better because I understand now as a writer of songs, I have certain setups and hooks and things that I do with certain de- devices I use in songwriting. That I'm like, oh, this is not about. What they're saying, mm. it's about the device. Correct. It's about the the structure of a joke mm-hmm. and the fact that as long as you get to the punchline, you could you have the freedom to have free speech to say all this stuff. And I was able to appreciate it in a different way, but it took me it took a lot of knowledge and wisdom. There's a conceptual thing about it, and mm. that's what the directors Penn Jillette and Paul Provenza set out mm. to do. Yeah, which was to get a hundred comedians, mm-hmm. some of the most famous on the earth. Mm-hmm. And tell this joke, and people were crying at some of the telling of the joke. Mm-hmm. That is not a, a movie that could be made right now. Mm-mm. Right, no, it not is. At all. It is, not, and I wouldn't sign the release until I saw the clip of me. And then I still went, "Wow, what will this be like? I don't. Should I sign the release?" Mm-hmm. And if you watched the un edited footage, which I don't think exists with the director's voices, I kept saying, I can't do this. And the, their voices are on the, tr- on the original Is footage. Is that why your part gets, keeps getting cut? That's where, well... Because like, you, don't, you don't tell the joke straight. You tell it, and then you crack up, and then there's voices in the Then background. I go, I can't do this. Yeah, and they're and then going, they, yeah. Bob, come on, just do it. Just tell it. And they cut that part out where you don't hear them. Because mm-hmm. I was very hesitant, because I knew it was horrible, but I knew... I could tell it, but it's not for public consumption. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so, but George Carlin, who was the Obi Wan Kenobi of the movie, said, mm-hmm. "You don't tell this joke." Mm-hmm. And then I did it, and it became this whole thing mm-hmm. because we hadn't seen anything like it, and they worked four years on it, and it it had it was at the Creative Coalition is a great organization. Mm-hmm. That's they did the premiere in New York, mm-hmm. and it was all about saying something wrong and. Um, and I did it because that was the assignment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you understood what the mission was. And the mission came out of Gilbert Godfrey doing the Hugh Hefner roast, That's right. which was not arable. And it was they made them do a Comedy Central roast two weeks after 9-11 in New York City. Mm. And Jimmy Kimmel hosted it. It was They never aired it. But Gilbert Gottfried launched into this joke because he was bombing so badly. <laughs> and Gilbert has no 
filter mm -hmm. and did it and told this joke. And I'd say about a, a quarter of the people were laughing and the mm -hmm. rest, understandably, were horrified. <laughs> and that was the moment in the movie yeah. where it's almost like in network when Peter Finch is yelling, right. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going right, to take it anymore. Right. It's that moment. So there's something about it that will live. Um, I can't wind the clock back. Mm -hmm. It's part of something I did mm -hmm. that took a half an hour of my life. And I never said the aristocrats because I had to go on stage because I was upstairs at the Laugh Factory. You did. You ran out. I yeah. remember. You I ran had to out. go on. They announced yeah. my name. Yeah. It was so funny. And <laughs> I, it's ironic that I never did the That's punchline. That's even funnier. Wow. Yeah. So you just said a bunch of nasty shit for no reason. It was but it, it made an impact, and it, it now if you see it out of context, which truly upsets me, wow. where people will put it on YouTube uh, alongside other mm. things or a morning shock jock show that I was on, mm. and then they'll run those clips now 15 years later. Completely out of context. It's out of context, and of course I wish it didn't exist today that people could see it. Do I wish I hadn't said it then? Some of it, some of the mm. things, for sure. I was sent, I'm a set. I was sensitive about it then, wow. the aristocrats, because I knew people that had gone through that. Mm. So I had to do what you shouldn't do, which is block it out. Mm. So it's almost like you're pretending it doesn't exist wow. uh, when you're saying something horrific. And that's where those jokes that you want to make a point with come from that people regret. Mm -hmm. I had one one joke, and I did it. I think I did it on a special, which was... Something I, I mentioned rape, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend any rapists. Yeah. <laughs> now, the purpose of that is obviously I'm saying I hate rapists. Is that zero to 60? I think it might have been. Yeah. But anybody that knows anything about a good person or who I am, mm -hmm. uh, I but then people will go, well, why say it? Uh, zero to 60, I really enjoyed that. Um, Thank well, you. Before you did that, you did. You wanna, You were nominated for a Grammy for That's What I'm Talking About. Yeah. That had to feel awesome. It was amazing. Yeah. And um, and I was there, and I didn't think I was going to win. I thought uh, Tig Notaro was going to win, but mm -hmm. Kathy Griffin won. Mm -hmm. But it, it it's a very cool feeling. Yeah. And I was proud of the show. And the, the other thing is... All my stand-up specials have songs in them. So there's like... Yes. So if, if, I, if I got 15 minutes of music and I got nominated for a comedy album for a Grammy, I'm going, well, they know there's music in that. Right. So that's special. It is. You said, uh, when we were in Yellow Springs, you said uh, musical comedy is the lowest form of comedy. <laughs> well, parody. Music parody. Par parody, right? Yeah, I believe musical comedy mm -hmm. can be the highest form of comedy. Okay. You look at what Bo Burnham's just done. Yeah. You look at... I mean, some people that are great artists. I like Flight of the Concords a lot. I like. I love I like Flight of the Concords. They're great. Yeah. And I love the show. Oh, I, I watched that show over and over My yet. friend Troy Miller made that show. And uh, he's very, very uh, amazing. The, the Hippopotamus. Yeah. And, and, the, and the Rhyme Noceris. Those are great rhyme names. And mm -hmm. those guys can rap. Those they guys can, can do any style of music. And I'm saying this as a rapper. Those guys can rap. I was... I was, I was Hip hop popping, up. <laughs> it's just great. And they also totally went for it. They're right into camera mm -hmm. with all of it. Yeah, I mean, their music videos. I'm not crying. Is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just cutting onions. I'm not crying. Right. <laughs> um, what made you want to do zero to sixty in Brooklyn, my hometown? I um, had performed at the Williamsburg Hall of Music. Oh, great venue! And I just said that's where I want to do the okay, special. Okay, so that's where it was at. Okay, yeah, it's a great venue. Because I just went. This is. Um, I we did it. It happened last minute. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll be ready in about a month. And mm -hmm. they went, Well, we got the theater. Do you want to do it? And and the only thing I'm sad about was that they put the wall. They shouldn't have been a wall behind me because okay. I don't like when there's you want no, to see the stage. I want to see depth. Yeah, you know. But they they went and did it, and uh, I'm I'm really happy with it. And people have responded beautifully to it. But it's you know, it's. I'm very, very excited with this new 90 minutes I've been rolling, and it's just all different. It's, it's a new special. Yeah. It'll be, I guess I'll shoot it in the fall. That's the plan. Okay. We'll see how it goes. You're working it out right now. I'm work, that's where I'm touring. I'm touring because it's all new, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. everything. When you have all new stuff, mm -hmm. you want to go where you're going to work it. So I'm more excited, and also to get people to laugh right now. If they can safely laugh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with all the yeah. COVID stuff we're right. putting in, everything's in place. Mm -hmm. I just wish people would just 
take a roofie and get the shot. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Hilarious. a roofie. Take the shot. One thing you uh, said <laughs> in um, one thing you said in zero to sixty that I really appreciated and really resonated with me is you describe fame as the big bird suit. Yeah. That was a quick little bar though. That wasn't you didn't elaborate on that. You just yeah. said it and let it sit. And me as someone who I'm not as famous as you, but I have a degree of fame and notoriety. Of course. I'm like, yo, that's a almost perfect fucking description. Mm -hmm. The big bird suit. Can and you break I'm, that down a little bit? Well, I'm I'm six four. Mm -hmm. And after you're on TV a long time, if you are a, a big figure physically mm -hmm. and walk into a room, or if you're a person that knows who you are and you happen to have done music or mm -hmm. acting or whatever puts you out there, mm -hmm. and people, you you have a presence mm -hmm. usually, unless you're trying to... I always have a friend that goes, if you don't want people to look at you, just look for nickels. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep staring at the ground when right. you walk. You never look up. But yeah, I, I feel like I'm Big Bird, especially mm. because Big Bird is so, uh, in a good way, mm -hmm. in a good way, it's kids go, oh, you're, hi, Danny. You know, and it's a five-year-old in 2021 <laughs> saying, hi, Danny, and I've got right. a mask on. Right. Because they're just watching the show now. Mm -hmm. The fact that you even think that I look as good as I did when I was <laughs> 35. Right. You know, and then it's just... Um, that's the gift. That's the gift that people don't know is happening while they're doing it. They're like, why am right. I doing this thing that goes against my edge and all this? Yeah. Or why am I being so edgy when I could reach more masses? I right. mean, and you could, you know how to do that. But it's be Jasmine and I both have uh, brand new babies. And so I've been re watching, you know, now you can watch everything. Now yes. you can watch everything, right? Yes. Right. And so I'm like, with well, my child, I'm like, well, you need to know the classics. Mm -hmm. You know, Coco Melon or Coco Lemon or it's Coco Baby Melon Shark. All oh, that shit's cool. Right. You know, but you need to know about the Muppets. Yes. And I put on the Muppets and it's like parental advisory. <laughs> We were on some racist shit back then, just so you know. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I was like, okay, let me, let me put it on the Muppets. I'll, wait, wait till you get a little older for that. <laughs> uh, let's watch Sesame Street. I watched the very first episode of Sesame Street. And Big Bird, it's a whole different Big Bird, whole different costume, whole different voice. And the whole bit is Big Bird can't see the kid. And they're like, Big Bird, meet this kid. And Big Bird's like, where? Where's no kid here? Where? So I found that very interesting. I didn't even know. I have to watch that. Yeah, it's like the very first. On Disney, they got the very first Muppets. On HBO, they got the very first Sesame Street. I watched Sesame Street literally as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And that, not saying I was held back, but mm -hmm. I'm saying <laughs> right. I would come home from school. Right. It was still good. I watched it as a teenager, on, too. And, the, the kids shows back then were good, and they still are good now. I watched Electric Company. Electric Morgan Company. Morgan Freeman Morgan was on Freeman. Electric yeah. Company. And I used to watch that, too. It was 3 to one Contact, uh, Nova. Nova. Electric Company and Sesame Street. That was my afternoon. Right. All PBS programming. Mm -hmm. What about Care Bears? There was no Care Bears. Care Bears and were, Arthur. I was a did you guys watch Arthur? I know it was, I was after a your time. I was a full grown but... adult when Arthur came out. No. Okay, yeah, I, know. I, I don't right. know right. from that. And Teletubbies, forget that. Teletubbies. Oh, yeah. Power right. Rangers is the end of the world. You know, yeah. you know what's crazy? Power Rangers still comes on and it's still the fake fighting. And it's like, it's 2021. They didn't learn any kind of new effects. But I have a question for. Um, the, my fellow comedians, I'm going a little rogue. So um, you did historical roast with Jeff Ross, and I, Jeff Ross let me sit in on the writer's room. And so I remember with everyone else, they came in, they just gave them their jokes, and they are like, all right, and went on about their day. But when you came in, you had a presence, and you pretty much rewrote your whole thing. And I know that you're seasoned, very seasoned now, to where you know you can walk in a room and do that. But was that like your whole career, or at what point did you start having the um, the courage or the confidence to go in and say, no, this is what I'm going to say. This is how this is going to do. Go. I think it happened for me. With stand-up, you always get to be the, the, <clears throat> the captain of your ship. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the beauties of it. But yeah, I was doing what I needed to do to get a job. But then once uh, America's Funniest Home Videos happened, I wrote it with Todd Thick and Robert Arnott, but I was the one saying it. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the writers, and we wrote 65 pages for a half-hour show because I was doing the voiceovers too. Look out, you know. <laughs> oh, I'll go up here, you know, all that junk. So I think that gave me the wherewithal to go, I can't say that. 
Mm-hmm. And I've done so many shows since then, whether I was hosting or it was a game show, or um, I would, with a sitcom or other pilots I've done or other sitcoms I've done, um, I've gone to the exec producer, writer, and said, can we change this? You know, I don't like this, or mm-hmm. can we just rework it? And I, I learned... What you learn the most is be gracious about it. Mm-hmm. I think when I was doing America's Funny Home Videos, we were on such a fast track that I would go, I can't, no, I can't say it. It would be mm-hmm. too quick and mm-hmm. and too, and I was too young uh, and it shouldn't have been so abrupt. But I've kept a very strong relationship with Vin Bona. Mm-hmm. He's a friend, uh, the exec producer of the show. Mm-hmm. And so, and with all the guys, so, you know, and all the ladies that worked on it. But yeah, it just it came from many years of doing a lot of different kinds of TV shows and and making myself comfortable with teleprompter if you're hosting, mm-hmm. fixing everything, knowing where mm-hmm. you're gonna ad lib, yeah, planning your ad lib, yeah, blocking your ad libs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be standing here, but I'm not positive what I'm gonna say. Right, but right. this is what it is. Right. Um, you entered my realm and you did a rap song with Stuart Stone and Jamie Kennedy, the yeah. homie. Rolling with Saget. Um, do you still know any of those bars? I do. <laughs> do you, let's yeah, hear them. Bars. I'm Bob Saget. This is what I do. My house, my car. This is my crew. <laughs> I only roll with Jusami and Stu. <laughs> roll the mean streets of Malibu. <laughs> That's right. So, next time we're going to do it again, Bob Saget, my best friend. Break a break a Bob right. Saget. I'm going to tell you a funny story. Um, in that song, there's a bar where you go, I'm sorry, who are you again? Yeah. <laughs> and so... When I that text was the Paris you, Hilton. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Who are you again? When I text you for this interview, you had to save my number yet. And so you hit me back. I said, hey, Bob, come do my podcast. And you're like, how did you get this number and who is this again? <laughs> that was hilarious. I felt so bad. I was like, yo, he's the guy from the rap song. <laughs> I, I, it is. No. I do have qualities. <laughs> That's why they wrote it. Right. They, they, I've been friends with Jamie Kennedy a long mm-hmm. time. He's from Philly. Mm-hmm. I did did a Jamie Kennedy experiment on me back in the day. It's a good show. It was a damn good show. Yeah, really good it show. It was a different kind of hazing, mm-hmm. and he was in prosthetic makeup, and they mm-hmm. pretended they were at my house. It wasn't my house. Jamie, and- I used to party with him in Miami. Right. Oh. I want to say we had some interesting nights in Mansion. I, oh, gosh, I Miami. partied with Jamie also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. never partied together. No, just want that one night with John Mayer where there's pictures of it. That's hilarious. You want a cloud of smoke. That oh, was God. so much smoke <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Bob wants all the smoke, apparently. Cigars for me are my pot. That will, right. That is what it calms me down just enough before I get nauseous. Right. And if I smoke dope, I just. I don't know. I like. What I got picking? plenty of contact ties. Cigars here. for me are where I put my pot in to smoke. We gotta <laughs> stop. We gotta stop calling it dope, though. Every time you say I smoke dope, I'm like, I don't want to smoke old dope. School. That's old school. Like I know, yeah, but it's sorry. like the, the Why commercial. Why do you think they call me a dope? That was the slogan. <laughs> yeah. So what? What would I call it? Weed. Yeah, just say weed. Or I don't smoke right. a blunt. Say I don't smoke a, a tray, a J, marijuana, cannabis. You know, put your pinky in. That's a whole thing, though. Because if you watch the Fab Five Freddy documentary, he talks about how the word is called cannabis. That's the official name for it. Right. The me- Mexican word for it is marijuana. But the, in Reefer Madness in those days, they were trying to scare people by saying these black jazz musicians and these dirty Mexicans are the ones who are smoking pot. So the federal government started calling it marijuana to associate it with Mexican people. Oh, So wow. like the progressive thing to call it is cannabis. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, that's that's where I'm gonna be from now on. Yeah, that's the dope I makes me feel and bad about myself. Cannabis my whole life, and I I've just been, learned that this year. Cannabis. Yeah. Um, for, uh, first of all, in the song you forgot to say Bob Saget, bitch, which we were waiting for. <laughs> but uh, in zero to sixty, you talked about um, working shitty gigs, and as comics comedians, we know. Oh man, what is what is your shittiest of the shitty gigs that you worked? Uh, it's an easy one. A hell of you. This is this is the easiest one I can tell you. So my worst gig <laughs> was in Beaumont, Texas. I was like 22. I got booked for some cash, not much, just enough to get me there and stay in a terrible place. <laughs> and I'm behind a cage, behind chicken wire. What? Playing music behind chicken wire. Like the and Blues Brothers. Like the Blues, exactly that. And they threw bottles at me and glasses like at me Brothers. the whole time. Yeah, that's, and while I'm on stage, that's shit. it is. And I turn to the... A bar owner, and I said, they, they hate me. He goes, no, they love you. Do your whole set. Right. And I did like 45 minutes, 
And I just kept joking about it, but it just, it was terrifying because I was afraid that glass was going to break off and get my eye and stuff, yeah. but they didn't give a shit. It wasn't fake glass. Oh my God. I just, I, I'm, I'm picturing crazy. you on stage right now like, sometimes it's hard to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have country songs, but I was doing music parody, the lowest yeah. form of comedy. <laughs> Blues Brothers is my absolute all-time favorite movie. It's a special thing. And Blue Lou, when they walk into Bob's Country Bucker and he goes... Chicken wire, yeah. It's the way he delivered that was pitch perfect. The other thing about that movie is kind of my mantra for this time, for why I'm out. People are going, Bob. Why do you want to tour? Why are you out on the road? Do, you don't need to. I go, no, no, no. I've never needed it more. I've never been. It's Blues Brothers. It's we're on a mission we're on from a God. Mission from mm-hmm. God. And I'm not saying I'm on a religious pilgrimage, right. but I'm on. Uh, yeah, I am, uh, I guess I would say spiritually drawn mm-hmm. to serve a purpose mm-hmm. to, and if I've got whatever number of people we did, you know, last Saturday was 2000 people at the Wiltern. I was part of this vet benefit for, for, with Bill Burr, that his thing. And it, f- it feels so good to have that exchange with people live after this time we've been through and we all have been reset by it. Yeah. And if you can find the positive in it amidst all the feelings of being, you know, held back, being told no, you know, dealing with everything that's come out of it, mm. all the pain, yeah. all the anger, all of the the social unrest, the political hatred. I keep thinking if aliens will just attack and just be the the gritty, horrible pieces of shit they are in these movies that we keep mm. watching, they always look the same. They're right. like like the alien or, right. you know, they're just like green and they get your guts out, right. you know, and then you kill them with, I don't know, fire or water right. or music. Music, like Mars Attacks. <laughs> and Mars Attacks is me, me. Right. But then this, this wonderful thing that... Uh, 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 Krasarinsky mm. made this uh, uh, Quiet Place Quiet Place 2 I haven't seen it yet it's, so no spoilers yeah. no it's yeah. it's the first one uh, the, yeah. I'm ready for the brilliant. third brilliant it's unbelievably great and those are the monsters that's what we look at I do think that if a good person mm-hmm. was you know I'm a blue state I'm a I'm a, I'm a red state I'm or I'm black I'm white mm-hmm. you're I'm racist next to each other if an alien comes and goes for one of them of that human being I would think that 60 to 70 percent of the people would help that other person mm-hmm. I think we are we are hopeful. I think an alien attack. I mean, that's that's a sad number, sixty or seventy percent. It should be ninety nine point nine percent. Well, how about we let the aliens attack the racists, rapists, and all of the criminals, and then everyone else will come together. Yeah, the I aliens. don't mind that. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. We I'm don't not... wish harm on anybody, but if the aliens want to kill really evil people, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, sacrifice that, shit, them in this, first. In this shit happens in this fantastical hypothetical science fiction scenario that we're conjuring up here. <laughs> um, I, I, I would, and my morals and my principles make me want to agree with Bob that in that situation, we would come, and again, completely hypothetical, but in that situation, <laughs> we would come together as humanity. You know, hypothetically, hopefully, I honestly don't really know what I would do if an alien was going to attack because probably... A year or so ago, I probably wouldn't give a shit, but now I actually have something to live for. So maybe I might have to help a racist or something kill an See, alien. The burden of being a parent. That's right? Because before I'd been like, fuck it, let's right? party. Well, you remember a movie that really resonated with me, which was Crash. I saw it with one of my daughters, mm-hmm. and we cried so much mm-hmm. when this racist cop, and what makes a racist cop. Is that, is that Dandy Newton was in it? I don't. I, don't I think know. yes. You're right. This guy knows. You're right. <laughs> I've seen that movie so many times that she, I can't. That movie when he go, uh, mm-hmm. people should see it if they haven't seen it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think it works this moment. Mm-hmm. I think it. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's been hurt by time. No, it, no, it's, it's well. timeless. It's a timeless I watched, movie. I must have watched Crash maybe two years ago again. You know, and and and, I, and it hit me like. Because it's the type of movie I watched when it, when it won all those awards, and I didn't look at it again. And it was on TV. I was like, okay, oh, I remember Crash. And I looked at it. I was like, okay, they were taking chances when they made this movie. Mm-hmm. And it breaks my heart, and it, it makes me cry, and it gives me hope for humanity. We had Reginald Hudlin on 
this program. Mm, mm. Right. Great guy. Mm. Reginald Hudlin had a TV show on HBO called Cosmic Slop. Yeah. First episode, it was like hosted by George Clinton. You know, first episode is aliens come down to earth and they tell him, look, we're going to fix the economy. We're going to fix, you know, the, the water. We're going to fix the environment. We're going to make it so the food is bountiful and everything. You just need to give us all your black people. And that's like the, the premise of the first episode of that. Holy shit. So what what do you do as the lead as the world leaders? What the, what is the decision they have to make? We know what they would do, but And they had all these they had Can all these I rules. see this? It's on you can watch it on YouTube. Okay. I, don't, I think it only exists on YouTube right now. I mean Jordan Peele would make something like that. Yeah, that sounds like the you know, he was right. he was he was leaning into like the you know, uh, afrofuturistic black sci-fi shit. For him to get that show on HBO, what was it 87? I mean, and I remember watching you know, HBO back then as a kid with my father and not getting it at all. The fuck is this? Mm. But then I became friends with Reggie Hudlin. And I oh, went back you. and watched it again, know, knowing what I know about art now mm -hmm. and knowing what I know about what a what a black guy like that had to go through to get a show like that on HBO. Mm -hmm. It was like as cheesy as some of the elements of it are, like the idea of it, the premise of it is so, oh my God. So like. Not now. Yeah. Let's bring that back. <laughs> Well, shit, man. He's such a filmmaker. Oh, yeah. He's amazing. One. It was one of my favorite. Well, this is now my new favorite interview, but it was one of my favorites. Yeah, this is amazing. Thank you for spending so much of your time. I don't want to leave. And what do you guys got to do? Why I do mean, I you, to... got your, you got Saget is here for you. I should come and do your, Yes, Bob Saget is here for you. It's that I would, love, would you do it? I would love to. I'll be hitting you up because now you're identifiable on my phone. <laughs> 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 I can reach you now. You can stick around. Do you know who Blueface is? Blueface no. is a rapper, a 24-year-old Crip rapper from California, who we are interviewing next. I'm going to stick around for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Blueface. But then I've I got to go talk to a, an investment person about, uh, you know, uh, NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> I got all kinds of plans. I you and Grimes, you huh? Thank you for having me. No, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Saget on a people's party. Give it up. Give it up. Saget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I loved every moment. And I learned not to call it dope. Yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>